sorry, I should use the microphone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the kind introduction. As I will talk about new models for personalized oncology and cancer drug discovery, please allow me a short excuse in the history of uh, cancer drug discovery. So in the past, the cancer research was really based on phenotypic drug discovery. So what this means is shown here on this slide. So you know that uh, tumor cells have a certain phenotypes, they have a fast proliferation and um, invasive growth and um, alterated metabolism. And what uh, scientists have done in starting in 1950 around, they screen compounds which interfere with this uh, phenotype. And at the beginning they have used the syngenic mouse models as I show here, then the 2D cell cultures have been implemented in the research, and later also the first uh, xenografts, so transplanting human tumors and immunodeficient mice, have been used. And this approach is really, as you may know, rather empirically. It was not very well, uh, was not very successful. But uh, still, the, most of the currently used chemotherapeutic drugs have been discovered uh, by this type of research. With the introduction of the molecular biology, the research changed a little bit and switched to a target-based drug discovery. And here, this approach is based on the identification of more or less uh, specific targets on the tumor cells. Then you have to do a functional validation, so you have to show that this target is really related to a development of a tumor, and then you can screen for target inhibitors. So this has been started around uh, 1980s, and some of the first drugs which have been discovered, or some examples, are the anti-hormone, so CPA, so Botrona acetate was the first anti-androgen, and then it continued with imatinib, Herceptin, and so on, so you probably all know these compounds. So this is a very interesting approach, but still also here success rate was very low, and the problem here was that uh, this is probably too specific. And why is this too specific? So cancer is definitely not a homogeneous disease, but cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. So you know, meanwhile, uh, there have been some first papers that if you uh, do a biopsy from one larger tumor and to analyze different areas, you uh, can really see that uh, these areas are very different. Some tumors have stem cell characteristics. Uh, a lot of uh, tumor cells have, have certain backup pathways, so they can circumvent if you block a certain uh, target. And some, uh, this is uh, very new, some of these uh, oncogenic mutations, they have a very low frequency, only 1% or maybe only 0.5% of the tumors have this uh, mutation. And then there is another area which comes in, this is a microenvironment, so tumors may have an aberrant vasculature, they have altered stroma which can contribute to the tumor growth. They can interfere with the immune system in different ways, and some tumors are responsible, others are not, not, not responsible to the uh, immune therapy or to the immune system. And also hypoxia and necrosis and inflammation may also contribute to the tumor growth. And last but not least, metabolism and drug transport also can play a very important role in the growth of tumors and in the efficacy of certain drugs. So what one has realized, and this is a problem uh, why all these old approaches have not, so, have not been so successful, if you look for the classical drug testing cascade, as it is shown here on this slide, uh, the Cascade is rather sequence, so at the beginning you start with some target validation and then you start with pharmacology and later PK and uh, toxicology comes in and this is uh, a problem because it takes so long time, you should rather really uh, combine all these approaches in 
uh, one experiment, and then the most important problem with this classical drug discovery cascade is uh, the, that the disease models you have implemented in this type of research, uh, they do not reflect the heterogeneity of the tumor. So what they have done in the past, they have screened one or two lung cancer models with a drug, so activity and promised okay, this drug will work in lung cancer, but later if they went in a clinical trial, didn't work at all, and therefore they have, for each drug, have had to, do, had to do a large number of clinical trials in all the indications, and the success rate was very low. Therefore, in the last five, maybe five to ten years, uh, the drug discovery research, drug discovery research switched a little bit, and uh, some new types of research have been implemented. One is the targeted phenotype based drug discovery where you combine both approaches and also then this resulted in translational research uh, and included the systems biology now. And especially target uh, translational research really should then reflect the disease heterogeneity in preclinical models and the aim of this research is then really to generate hypotheses for uh, clinical trials and then help to translate this into the clinical practice. And especially translational research has now a lot of tasks which are really new and implemented in comparison to the older types of research. So translational research should really verify the selective effects of target interference should determine the prevalence of the target in the cancer patient population, should investigate the mechanism and the mode, the mode of action and the mechanisms of resistance, should also allow correlation of target inhibition with pharmacodynamic defects in the respective relevant population, and also should help to generate first rationals for drug combinations, this is very important. Uh, now and then identify uh, predictive markers for response. All this together is really uh, dedicated to one very important approach, we need to define patient populations uh, for the clinical development, so responder enrichment, this is currently the most important task. Why do we have to do this? I would like to show you one example uh, from the recent track development with EGFR receptor inhibitors. You all know the success story from Dennis Lehman and Genentech with the HER2 inhibitors in breast cancer. So and, uh, it's very well known that EGFR plays a very important role or may play a role in colon cancer. So therefore they started to develop uh, antibodies against the EGFR for colon cancer. And here's one example for panitumumab. They went in the first phase 3 study and used EGFR as a biomarker and as you can see there is some effect but if you look here for the pro pro uh, progression free survival the effect is really really small so it's 8 versus uh, 7.3 weeks so 4 days or so in improvement. And at this time when this study was performed uh, it was not absolutely sure that the another biomarker may play a role but uh, KRAS has been identified, so mutations in KRAS, activating mutations in KRAS have been identified and therefore they did a second uh, phase 3 study where they, com where they compared the efficacy of the antibody in a subpopulation which uh, has been KRAS mutated and, and this in the other part in wild type KRAS. And as you can see here now in this subpopulation no effect, whereas in the KRAS Y type uh, population you have really a very good effect of 12 weeks versus 7 weeks, so it's almost 50% improvement. So this is really showing us the way how you have to uh, set up clinical trials and perform new studies. There's another problem, especially if you are working with uh, small molecules, certain types of uh, kinase inhibis inhibitors, for example. Many of these small molecules are not tar absolutely target specific, so they may inhibit a lot of other targets. Here is very nicely shown for many of 
the trucks which are currently in development or already approved. And you can see here some of these trucks really hit a lot of targets here, uh, so affinate and so infinite, also called multi-target kinase inhibitors because they really cannot make sure which target is inhibited. And therefore, these drugs may have different response profiles also. They may have, a, as a major target, the identical uh, target. So if you would like to start translational research, you need models. And usually you are studying in vitro in cell culture in oncology. And meanwhile, there have been uh, large panels of tumor cell cultures developed. This has been started at the NCI with the NCI 60 panel. So this is a very well-known tumor cell line panel. And the NCI has done a large uh, screening on these models. So I think meanwhile several hundred thousand compounds have been screened. All these data are, are available. And with the introduction of systems biology, all these response data have been correlated with molecular biology data, so with gene expression mutations and so on. And you can really draw very good uh, prediction and modeling from these panels meanwhile. This has been extended and here the Broad Institute together with Novartis has a cancer cell line and the Clopidia and here meanwhile almost uh, 1000 cell lines uh, are in this uh, database and they have screened um, 24 trucks at this time I think they really increasing this every week or every month and they also have a complete molecular profiling of these um, cell lines done meanwhile and these data are available Another very interesting tool is uh, high content imaging analysis. This really allows now to image single cells on drug effects and you can really with this method gain very interesting information about the structural and metabolic changes within one cell and you can use these uh, informations for the further drug development or even for personalized uh, treatment. I would like to show you one example from my own research. I have been involved in the development of a new epotilone. So this is a microtubule stabilizer and we were interested how these uh, compounds are working. So we treated some tumor cells, colon cancer cells here in this case, with the compound. Normally if the cells are untreated and they are proliferation, uh, proliferating very fast, you can see they have a bipolar spindle. But if you treat with the compound, you have monopolar, tripolar, or even multipolar spindles. And if then the mitotic checkpoints are active, then you can see that these tumor cells undergo apoptosis and you can really nice identify the mode of action of uh, certain compounds. The next step in cell culture is the move from 2D cell cultures into 3D cell cultures. So under certain conditions, you can see that tumor cells in this type of culture can form small organ-like uh, structures. Here is an example from my colleagues for colon cancer, and you can really see uh, something like crypts here in this. And these type of models are 